Paddy Power, sponsors of the Road to Cheltenham. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to an earlier than usual edition of Road to Cheltenham. It's also longer than usual, and we're packed this show, full of special guests and lots of insight about what's coming up next week. Of course, my co-presenter, Ruby Walsh, is here. We have to complain about these mugs. There's no Road to Cheltenham merch. No, it's just just shows you where we are, Lydia. It does, in the pecking yeah, order. Unbelievable. Below bottom, the bottom, Friday bottom of the barrel. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no croissants, below yeah. the... Below the uh, Look on Sunday. That's a Friday show called again? The Friday Club. Friday Club. <laughs> he, he knows, really. <laughs> <laughs> Loads to talk about. First thing to say is the news that was released today that Ballyburn, for Willie Mullins, goes for the Gallagher bearing Bingham and not for the Supreme. I almost fell off my chair with this being announced today rather than Sunday. There was two of us. What do you make of the decision itself? I think he's losing it, that Willie Mullins, uh, <laughs> coming out on a Thursday. With news that could be kept until Sunday. My God. Took horses out of the champion hurdle, declaring his hand on Thursday. Um, <laughs> what do I make of it? At least yeah. we still don't have a clue what runs in the Arkle or the Turners, so he's no. holding on to some... He some better, he better hang on to that. Um, what do I make of it? I, yeah, I could see it happening. Obviously, when Paul broke it down, which tree was Paul going to ride? And obviously didn't... It was a tough one, like Heel Atlantic or Tully Hill. He's going to have to get off one of the two of them. And um, looks like he's getting off Heel Atlantic. It does. We'll talk more about the knock-on effect for both races later on in the show. But first, we're going to welcome on our first guest, and that is six times Cheltenham Festival winning trainer, Dan Skelton. Dan, welcome to Road to Cheltenham. It's good to have you on. How are you? Oh, very well, thank you. Thanks for having me. Well, it's a pleasure to have you here. And you, have, you, have you got all your decisions made? Are you, or are you uh, following Millie, Willie Mullins and still waiting to, on a couple of races? Uh, I've made most of them. I'm doing a, a Willie Mullins on one of them, though, but I'm getting towards making a decision. And now, well, let's start there. That's the obvious one. I, I assume we're talking Grey Dawning here, aren't we? Yeah. Yeah, OK. So talk us through your thinking. Give us some live thinking from you at the moment. Um, I spoke to John Pullen yesterday and he, the, the forecast is there for all to see. I asked him for an interpretation of how that will actually manifest itself on the track. Um, he said to me, obviously, the heavy will disappear overnight. Last night it'll be soft. Obviously, there could be some good to soft if you get a good day tomorrow creeping in. There's rain forecast over the weekend. It's highly likely to start the festival on soft ground. Um, I think that's not going to take anyone by surprise. I don't think I'm leaking any of his... Uh, any of his secrets by that. So uh, there's a little bit of rain during the week. So I'm happy to say that the ground is going to be soft enough to suit him on the Thursday. Um, and if you look at the, the pure maths of the race, uh, you know, it's an easier task uh, on the Thursday than it is on the Wednesday. <clears throat> We're, you know, that, that's in terms of numbers um, uh, and, uh, of course, betting. I mean, I'm not letting others decide where I run my horses. Um, you know, we, I will make that decision ultimately with the owners and Harry. But, you know, I think for all looking in, I think everyone can see that the Thursday race, if the ground was acceptable, is the best race to run in him because he's not a slow horse. And going on to the new track has its advantages compared to the old for a staying horse like him. Um, but you've got to remember, he was mighty impressive when he won over two mile five at uh, Haydock, and I think he was an unlucky loser at December Cheltenham's meet. Um, Cheltenham's December meet. Surely, if you're looking at the forecast and you watch that forecast that Paul Barber used to always watch on a Sunday, that Paul Nichols um, stands by and was musing a couple of years ago at Cheltenham when Cheltenham was watered. Surely, that's the forecast you go by too. Well, yeah. The only thing is, is these forecasts can change very quickly, and obviously, when you move into the spring. Um, they, they, you know, breezes and, and showers. When you're only dealing with showers, um, obviously they move quickly. But yeah, the, the Sunday long term forecast is the best one. Uh, and then there's all these apps that we've all got now that we've, you know, you can always find a forecast that'll suit you. I've always got <laughs> <laughs> So I can see your, your reasoning. So if you think about when Grey Dawning ran against Ginny's Destiny, there was that error, wasn't there, at yeah. the second last? So you're thinking really that I could have beaten that horse then, I can beat him again? 
yeah, but they're novices. They're all entitled to improve. And I don't just think that Ginny's destiny, you know, is an open door. Uh, I think Ginny's destiny definitely improved from mm. December to the April run, uh, the uh, January trials run. I think that was a very, very good run. There's no doubt he's improved. I think we've improved. So, you know, equal improvement. Um, it'll be a tight race, but, um, you know, they... they with respect to Ginny's destiny, he doesn't have the form of uh, Stay Away Faye or Factor File, uh, and he perhaps doesn't have the um, uh, reputation of those either. You know, mm. by Harry Cobden's own admission in in his piece for the for a build up to Cheltenham, you know, he he, he fancied Stay Away Faye, and um, you know, you don't you don't need really need to listen to to Willie talk for too long about Factor File to work out that that's a, a pretty serious deal. Ruby's going to run through Grey Dawning's form and his thoughts about it. So I'll, I'll hand over to you. Yeah, I, I think his form is rock solid. And to me, I like the way Dan is leaning towards the Turner series at Exeter when Stay FAFA gets back up on the inside to beat him. Now, I think he jumped hugely forward from here to Haydock. That was obviously fitness because he just folded the last furlong there for horse you would think would have no trouble stamina wise. But he was really impressive in Haydock. His jumping was rock solid, launched a bit at that one. But the way he attacks would always suggest to me that two and a half as a novice is going to suit him best. He put Guy de Menil in his place on this day, who was uh, second season novice and Napoli is behind him. Obviously, then he went to Cheltenham, and there is that mistake of the second mass. But as Dan has just said, novices, to be honest with you, will that mistake at Cheltenham in December be the winning of a Turner's? It, it, it could be. Um, here he goes, guesses, steps into the middle of it. But you love the way he saves himself. You love the way he puts his feet out. He's, you know, he's trying to keep himself upright. And it was really impressive how he runs after Genius Destiny. Then he goes back to Wink, to Warwick even. And to me, he had this race won at the fourth last. It clambers over the last a little bit. But I, I, I think the way he goes, I'm, I definitely fancy him more in the Turners. I hope that's the way Dan goes with. I'll be honest, Dan, I'm slightly the way around because I look at this race at Warwick and I think how strongly run it was with Broadway Boy and with Apple away and that Grey Dawning has finished with plenty of running and I think of his Leamington success last season as well in deep ground. I know that was two mile five, but nonetheless, it seemed to me all about stamina. He does seem a bit as though fences are made him quicker, though, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think so. He, like Ruby says, he, 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 jumps, he jumps like a good novice. You know, um, OK, there's not the mistakes in there. You can pick a hole, uh, not a hole, but you can pick a fault in, in, in each round of his jumping so far. But you'd struggle not to do that with most novices. I just think I know what you mean about the um, the Warwick race. And he, he did look like he was definitely the best stayer. But with respect, I think on that day, he was just the much best horse. Um, mm -hmm. I don't think Broadway Boy ran his race. And with respect to Apple Away, um, you know, she hasn't quite gone and perhaps done what, a grade one novice hurdle winner last year was expected to do. So, you know, I, I, I think we won that day, not necessarily because we stayed the best, but because perhaps we were the only one in form on the day. Um, I, I don't, every time Harry's got off this horse, he's always said, he's not slow, he's not slow. Mm. Um, you know, but listen, if we were lucky enough to win a Turners, um, I would be saying to you in the, um, in the winner's enclosure afterwards, there's only, you know, there's only one direction we want to go in. Mm. Um, so, you know he is a stayer, but you know I think um, I think staying horses can win can win the, the turners, especially on that track. Mm. Well, I always thought you had I always thought you had lived in the winners' enclosure. Obviously, you have these speeches prepared. <laughs> it sounds like a decision to me, Dan. I'll be perfectly honest. It just sounds turners. It sounds like you've made it to me. Well, we, I, I, in all honesty, I have, but I just need that final that uh, that final bit of um, weather to just drop our way. You know, mm. I couldn't. If it was gen you know, if it was good to soft when I went to declare on um, uh, Tuesday morning, I'd have wished I'd have I'd have wished I declared on Monday morning for Wednesday. So, you know, just that last little bit to make sure of really. Okay, a decision you have made is to head towards the Ryanair with Protectorat, and I think, you know, I think we can see from the the Demon Chase last time an aggressive ride over the Ryanair trip. It's going to be right up his street, don't you think? Yeah, but he's always been that way, though, Dan. Even I remember Bridget riding him in in Aintree the year before last. How keen he was over three miles. He's always been a horse you were trying to settle over three, and maybe letting them run over a bit shorter is going to be the the real making of them. Well, yeah, and and I've got a little theory. I'm not actually sure that you know in the UK the Sonderson's haven't really seen out the Gold Cup trip in the past. 
Um, and you know, he, 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 to be sim- you know, talk simply. This year, especially, he hasn't been hitting the Gold Cup markers. So there's no point going going for that race, being 33 to one, and uh, you know, and being happy with fifth or sixth or something, because you know we're a bit more ambitious than that. And he's you know, time's ticking. He's not an old horse, but he's by no means you know he's probably got more years behind him than he has in front. So um, as a you know, as a competitor, so I, I think it's important that we you know we are bold, and that's what we decided after the Betfair this year. Which for whatever reason he jumped that first jump like that, I was never happy. Looking back on how he's been since, it was perhaps foolish of me to think that he was in as good a form as we could have him for, for the Betfair because he's been a lot better since. But, you know, that's just me holding my hands up going, we thought he was good on the day, but, you know, things have changed. So we decided to go more aggressive with him, run him in some, run him in a handicap, you know, take on these horses that, you know, uh, you know might not be taking each other on. You know, we might as well go and be... The, the, the participant in these races, he'll go there with good recent form. Okay, it's not winning form, but you know, Long Press and uh, Shishkin are the two highest price horses in the Gold Cup, and we are just behind them. So, mm. um, I think we're we're a, a, a valid candidate for the for the Ryanair aggressive ride will be um, will be given, and um, you know, I don't really do any of those um, time comparisons, but I actually uh, frustrated myself today watching the watching the last circuit, the Gold Cup, and the last <laughs> circuit of the Ryanair, and I was surprised actually how little there was in it. Mm. And on his best day, he's as good as the best days of any of those horses in the Ryanair, isn't he? Well, I think so. And if you look at his numbers, um, his handicap marks and his performance figures and everything else, um, I think he leads on maybe two two out of three or so like that so um yeah look he, he's not going there as the, as the favorite he isn't the like, most likely winner but at the same time if he if he won at ryanair i don't think anyone go well that was absolutely impossible no now unexpected party you've got a few haven't you in the grand annual am i right in thinking that this was the plan with unexpected party last year but he didn't quite make the cut yes you're absolutely correct <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So has this been a, another 12-month plan, then? Uh, no, the, the immediate plan was to get a race under our belt. So we made sure we were very ready for Chepstow, uh, at which he won. Um, and he just paid the price for winning that day, to be honest with you. He, was, he, he, didn't, win, he didn't win that race because he was better than, um, than Paul's horse. I can't, his name escapes me now. Um, uh, but he, he was just ready. He was just so ready. He had uh, all that experience from the year before. A handicapper whopped him up. Um, he went and ran in the Pally Power, ran well without winning, mm. ran again, ran well without winning. The handicap had him too high, and he's released him a little bit now uh, to a more reasonable mark. Um, I was kind of thinking he'd just turn up here and, you know, be a runner, and you know, couldn't couldn't say you fancied him, couldn't say you didn't fancy him. Um, but I don't know why the last ten days he just start to he just started to shine a bit. Um, which I didn't, I didn't really expect. He's not, he's not normally that type of horse. He's a very laid-back type of horse at home. He wouldn't really, you know, unless he was a good-looking grey like he is, you, he wouldn't really stand out. Um, but yeah, he's just, he's just started to shine a bit. So I'm quite happy about that. I have to admit to a pet theory of thinking that something like the Grand Daniel over two miles, rather than sort of stretching out to two and a half, might suit him best. How do you feel about that? Yeah, he just doesn't stay the intermediate trip. We've, we've yeah. tried. Um, he, he just doesn't do it, so we take the hint. It was Napper's Hill that he beat in Chepstow, who bolted in then and Wincanton in the Rising Stars. He's Great down team. eight, just behind Fugitive in that run. I'd love to know how he got him down the air pound. <laughs> <laughs> Paul said got... to me that there, Chepstow, you won't beat us again, boy. I said, that's <laughs> all right, but I'm taking you on again. <laughs> <laughs> You've got Calico, Fred Darm and Pembroke also in the Grand Annual. Are they likely to join him? Yeah, Calico runs... Um, had a great year without winning, he, just because he's, you know, there's a, a lot of the, um, I don't know why, but he, he's kind of avoided the top rated handicappers. So he's always been in these races where he's top weight. And that's been highly frustrating because he, you know, he hasn't had the chance to get weight off a few. So that'll be nice for him to get a bit of weight. He's highly consistent, likes the track. Um, he wouldn't be without an each way chance. Uh, if Fred Arm needs two to come out to get in. And if he does, he, he'll definitely line up. Um I feel like he's just he's just got away from us a little bit. I think I thought he was very very progressive um, on occasions, and then he can chuck in the odd. I wouldn't call it disappointing run, but it's just a, a bit of a non-happening run. 
Um, if you got on some real nice ground, and I'm not saying that next Wednesday will be it. I think the better the ground, the better his chance. But when he gets on some nice ground, I think he'll, I think he'll bounce back to something like you've seen. If I can move you on to Langer Dan, who, of course, finally got his in the Coral Cup last season after what happened in the Martin Pipe the previous season. Is he, though, in the same kind of form this time around? Um, I'd say until three weeks ago, I was very concerned. Um, he bled on one of his runs this year. Um, I had a few uh, that uh, sort of ran moderately. A, a great example we'll talk about later is Lotus Sud had crippling ulcers. Um, I thought I just better check him. Checked him. And now, don't get me wrong, he wasn't he, he, he wasn't in a he wasn't a severe case, but he had some ulcers. Um, we treated him for those. He, his work has improved in the last three weeks. You know, sufficiently enough to say that I think he's back to being a potential player in this race. Uh, but up till then, um, you know, there was no point in me training with a gallop. I'd need to be training with a magic wand, to be honest with you. Um, but he's he, he has he has joined in now at long last. But he, he's not an easy horse. He actually had a surgery after last year's uh, Coral Cup. He um, had a, a collateral uh, collateral ligament surgery um, that he, he he got over pretty well, to be honest with you. But maybe it's just took a bit of time to get his confidence back under him or something I don't know but yeah we're back to thinking that um, he's a contender again this is really uh, encouraging sounds from him and what do you what do you remember from this day I mean it's so important isn't it to get these victories on the biggest stage that jump racing has yeah well the, the guy who just um, clapped hands with Harry there that's Colin Donlan and, and Cheltenham's is you know, Cheltenham's probably his four most important days of the year and this was his first winner in his colours um, and um, funnily story with this horse we actually bought him as a foal and uh, I rang up Colin when we'd broken him in at two and then into three and I said look Colin I said this horse he's, he's, he basically hasn't grown since he's a foal I think he's I think he's no good at all he said ah don't worry he says you know give him a chance you never know and um, he won his first three on when, when his first three unbeaten win in the listed race and he's turned up at every Cheltenham festival since and give us a right cheer on nearly all occasions apart from when he got brought down obviously but he's uh, he did a mag magnificent little horse really absolutely that's what giving a horse a chance looks like those are very yeah. special moments I mean you've been in, in oh yeah in Colin was when I was riding for Paul I remember going to uh, Chester with him one Christmas to ride, I think, Kay de Burley in a finale hurdle. Um, but look, he absolutely lives for it, loves the game, and fair play to him to have that kind of patience to buy a foal and, and keep going with him for that long. But yeah, but what about Lord of Sud? He's back down to 141. You've got Lord of Sud in the county hurdle. Last year you had Favoir down to a winnable mark. Maybe that's Langer Dan this year. Did this fellow blow his chance in the, the bet for a hurrier? That's, the, that's method. the method, yeah. yeah, yeah. Lord of Sud? Yeah. He, he needed he to was run. In second. Yeah, he needed to run that well to get in the race. I think. So you're happy at 135. You got a bit more up your Steve? I, I think so. Yeah, he's 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 a pretty good horse. Like we really fancied him for the um, Greatwood in November, and Harry said he could have pulled up passing the stands. We, uh, he was the one that we we gastroscoped and found really bad ulcers. So we were desperate to get those ulcers sorted, which we actually had done by Christmas. Um, but couldn't run him anywhere because everything kept getting called off. Um, so, by process of elimination, literally elimination, the first okay. race we could run in was the, was this race, um, and he just got he just got caught like a sitting duck by Ibirico Lord late on, having looked like he had the race put to bed. Um, that bit of match practice, there was no fitness improvement. Don't don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that you know he blew up because he definitely didn't. Um, but that bit of match practice has, has done him no no harm at all. You know, Ibirico Lord has been supplemented for a champion hurdle, which suggests mm. that Ibirico Lord has probably is, uh, as well handicapped a horse as we've seen in a, in a handicap this year. Um, and I think he's I think he's got a right chance on the Friday. So do I. I mean, I I think you had to be a horse as good as Ibirico Lord potentially is on that ground to be able to run down Lodisud because that looked like a decisive move to me and he wasn't stopping. He was still pulling clear of the rest of them. He was, and actually, if you watch Ibirico Lord, like he's, he's, not, he's, not, he's not winning anywhere until he sort of joins us. Um, the, whole way, the whole way, really, he looks like he's not going to win, but those good horses, they just they'd find a way, whether the ground was tacky for him that day or he got shuffled back or whatever, but... 
yeah, it's frustrating to get beat, but you know, we, we were beat with authority. We weren't an unlucky loser, you know, we were two and a bit lengths behind at the line, so there wasn't any crying done. But um I just when a horse hasn't had a competitive race for that long, you know, it, it, it's got to just sharpen them up, not necessarily fitness wise, but everything else, you know, it's just got to sharpen them up and get them ready for that battle. And you're a bit of a, a county hurdle specialist, aren't you? Four wins. Is the title of the Favois not likely to run this time around? He's going to run at um, he's going to run at Sandown. Sandown. At mm. Yeah, he's in really good form actually. A favour never normally works all that well, but he actually worked really well this week. So I said to Ian, who, who owns him, I said we better run him a bit quick. Um, <laughs> uh, but he he runs how he wants, to be honest with you. Um, and it would you know I wouldn't you know it would be accurate to say that the the Imperial Cup is not as not as deep a race as the County Hurdle. Mm. Um, taking nothing away from anyone or or, or anything, um, and I just thought that to go back and win a second one is really hard. So you know maybe we could make life a little easier for him, um, and so he's in on Saturday. What is your favourite winning moment at the Cheltenham Festival? I know what my favourite of your winning moments is. I wonder if they they're the same one. Financially, I'd say it was Sanctuary. But go on. <laughs> <laughs> I did tell you in certainty. <laughs> I'm thinking Mohaed, because the Mahayad scenes was... after that victory were amazing. Yeah, Mohaed was great. Chitty Bello was great. Chitty Bello was was for a great group a group of guys who you know had never thought they'd get a Cheltenham winner, but kind of had the horse that would would maybe give them it, um, and he delivered. Mohaed was an unbelievable story because. You know, realistically, unless it was on a second uh, a second string, how was Bridget ever going to get a winner at the festival? And she ended up with two. You know, she's absolutely brilliant at picking one. Um, you know, so yeah, they, they're, they're magic. But you know, any any winner, any big winner's got its got its own feeling and its own worthiness. You know, um, it's hard to pick a pick a real favourite. When I was when I was working for Paul and Ruby was riding them, there wasn't one better than Sanctuaire because I thought he was a certainty. Go on, tell me about that. Go tell me through the story. Uh, we got him from France. He was basically unrideable. He wouldn't leave the feet. Uh, wouldn't leave the, uh, the yard at all. Um, I was, he had uh, to ride him. He rode him himself. Oh, really? Yeah. L luckily, I was a little lighter in those days, and I rode him. Um, and I remember, for anyone who's been to ditch it, um, outside the Manor pub there, he wouldn't go any further. So I had one. I had a horse with Good me. Good judge, wasn't he? <laughs> <laughs> so I had, a, I had a horse with me. I said, I said to whoever was on it, I can't remember. I said, turn around. We're going to go down the flat gallop. We'll come back. We'll trot up past the pub. He won't. We won't stop going. We'll trot up past the pub and we'll canter up the hill. Well, he did that, and he still was pulling at the top of the hill. I went past the top of the hill where Paul was. I said, this is a machine, and um, like he, he perhaps didn't train on. Well, he was probably never going to train on because he, he he was so you had, you had to be so hard on him. <laughs> As a young horse, he's probably never going to train on to be a champion chase type horse. But um, you know, just as a young horse, he was he was just miles ahead of the others, absolutely miles ahead of the others. Mm. And then the handicapper gave him a mark 126, which was like Christmas for beating for beating Grand Cru in Taunton. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, they were good days. Happy days. Yeah. Well, Dan, thank you very much for joining us this evening. We really, really appreciate it. And also sharing your thoughts and your insight to all of your runners. Best of luck for next week. I hope it goes really well for you. Thank you. Take care. Thanks for your time tonight. Thank Here's you. Bye-bye. What did you pick up from there? What was the, the thing that most made you... Fred Arning runs in the turners, and I'd say the horse... He's fairly sweet in that horse in the county. Lotus said absolutely he yeah. is, isn't he? Yeah. Very much so. And I, think I can he's understand that. A bit more hopeful and confident about Langer Dan. Mm -hmm. But I'd say he's some sweet and Lotus said. But it is interesting if people and many people will at home like Langer Dan, festival form, like unexpected party, thinking mm. that the two mile is ideal and this was the target twelve months ago. Hearing that they've turned a corner lately, I think will be a very positive news for Oh, him. big time. And like obviously he gives Felvoir a chance at the weekend, so if he runs well, you know, it'll show his yards in good form. But they are in good form here. But like he's he's right and He's an up and well, not an up and coming trainer. He's well established trainer, but results at Cheltenham were really important to him. And a couple of winners there gets him more clients and gets him more money to invest. Absolutely, and more of those fabulous celebrations. They they are great celebrators. I enjoy you know I enjoy that. I think it's really important to show everybody how much you put of yourselves you put into the whole of this. And I think they do really show it. The Scotland, Scotland oh team. big time. But you even even see it in Nick, the London two lads. Um, but they are they're running a good show and. 
you wouldn't begrudge them any success they're having. Absolutely not. Right, now, as I mentioned, this is Road to Shetland Live. No, really, we're live. As late, uh, as, as, late as you were on Monday. <laughs> I might be referring to that. I might be referring to that. Anyway, Marine National in the R. Um, <laughs> our social media question for you all is, what is the best festival ride you've witnessed and why? So what is the best festival ride you've witnessed and why? You can contact us either via that email address, studio at racingtv.com, or you can at Racing TV us on Twitter, now known as X, of course. Just to give you an idea of the kind of thing we're talking about, there is uh, a certain uh, selection from Ruby, and I'm just uh, trying to get a tweet up from uh, one of the people who are following the Road Sheltenham show. This is from Alex Dunnigan, and I think you'll like this. He says, anyone who says Richard Lyman or Champ is wrong, so beware, everybody, if you were going to say that. There were great rides that in most jockeys, in that most jockeys would have given up. But for artistry and brilliance, it has to be Paul Carberry on Belvano in the Grand Annual. All other answers are incorrect. What do I win? What does he win, Ruby? I'd say you're a good judge, Alex, so you're winning a compliment from me. Um, but I'd agree with you. I thought this was a magical ride, uh, Paul on Belvano. Look, now he is 20 to 1. That does make it a little bit easier. But watch how far back he gets here. Uh, heading up the hill to the fifth last. And I know how far back he was because I was actually behind him on the, <laughs> on the, on the grey as he jumped the fifth last. But it's to stay sitting. And uh, when we were around the corner to the fourth last, like, he just, it was as if he just dropped him in there and you were floating around Clown Mellon on Thursday. And you know, here we are, top of the hill, still pulling the roller, and he's trying to tuck him in. I remember looking at him here thinking, if I can keep following him, well, I've got a squeak. And then my father got brought down here, brought down by Free World. Uh, yeah, good man, Free World. Um, but look, sits up again, heads up beside AP, doesn't want to go outside the green and the white stars. How many people would have the confidence just to sink? Yeah, I'm going a bit soon here, I'll just keep hanging on. But there are, there are brilliant rides, and I don't agree with Alex there in that if you say a champ or which time I'm on, you're wrong. You're, you're not wrong. They were brilliant rides. Um, I think Dickie was brilliant on the Tizard horse that won the Gold Cup. I think they were brilliant rides. Native Native River. River. But you look at rides, you think, how many people would have won on this horse? And I'm not sure there are too many people that would have won on Belvano. Now, I know, ultimately, he ends up winning easily, but, like, heading to the second last, that's his stable companion who was favoured in front. Barry, thanks for that, I think he was called. Paul's still in no rush. And this horse finds zero off the bridle. But he put, even there, he tucks back over. He's gone into Barry's slipstream, sits up to pop the last, and then has a little go. And when he starts to get there, you know Paul's not going to get too serious. He's only nudging, nudging, nudging. Come on, son. I, I thought it was brilliant to ride because you look at loads of rides you think, well, they didn't give up or you tried your hardest. Even I won on Norland. That was pure perseverance. But to me, that was skill. So, but between Alex and, and Ruby, you, you may as well not come in with your ideas of that because that, that, that's the answer. But, you know, we, we cannot give prizes for second, third and fourth, can't we? <laughs> you can, but every, and everyone's taste of what's a good ride is different. Yes. Uh, some people love people that don't give up. I, that's my particular taste, but... That's just opinion. That's what's brilliant about resin, because there's no definition. And readers, remember, when you put your selection forward, make sure you tell us why you think it's the greatest ride you've ever seen at the Channel Festival. And I'll tell you why you're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes, he will. <laughs> right. Our next guest is Danny Mullins, who has also tasted festival success. Danny, we were just talking to Dan Skelton. He was reminiscing about his wins at Cheltenham. What are your memories about your two successes on Flooring Porter? First one, I suppose it was an exceptional feeling crossing the line, getting that first Cheltenham winner was something extra special for me. It being during lockdown took nothing away from it. And then the second year, it's probably the only time watching the second year here. Is this the this might be the this first one? This is the first one. year. Yeah, there's not too many people around for that one. Um, <laughs> First year, yeah, he gives a lovely little jink to the right and heads on up the run-in. And the next year, he keeps something else up his sleeve for me. Uh, Florent Porter, always uh, a little bit of the mind games with him. This is the second year, yeah. A little look at the big screen there. It's the only big race that I've ridden in where it's never left plan A. Everything happened as smooth as it could. 
I was able to get Paul off the bridle on Classical Dream down to the last. Champ was coming out of it. Good jump at the last. And he wants to go left that year. Uh, that's probably the only little kink in it. But wasn't stopping the whole way to the line. Uh, hands and heels right. And away he goes like the, the tough little fella that he was. <laughs> It was tremendously like clockwork, wasn't it? I remember all the, <laughs> and the scenes afterwards as well. Obviously, it wouldn't be a flooring port of success if we didn't see this kind of thing in the winner's enclosure. That was probably the most nerve-wracking part. I think uh, whoever the big guy is holding me up is probably uh, Catelli in Ireland. Uh, I think I, I pulled a few hairs out of his head at some stage as well. <laughs> so, good fun, but good memories. And the question going into it, of course, was, you know, would he, would he manage with the crowds? Everybody was worried about whether he'd behaved down at the start with the extra atmosphere, it having been so quiet the previous year. But as you say, just went absolutely like clockwork. Everything here. Everything went perfect, you know. I, I, that's a credit to the guys uh, that, from Gavin's, leading them up, looking after him in the mornings. They had all the hard work done. They had him in a good mindset before I got on his back. Uh, and from there... It was just a case of, of me keeping the thing rolling along and letting the horse do the work. Were you surprised that Gavin has gone back over hurdles with him after being chasing, or did you kind of think he would? I suppose it was a 50-50 decision. I, I didn't think looking at the National Hunt chase was probably his other option. I didn't think he could win that race. And the stairs hurdle, it's probably still an open race. He ran a solid race last year with an interrupted preparation. Wasn't that far off Tihufu, who was favourite. And he'd have his chance. But for me, I think if he gets a fair mark, the Irish National could be his race. Even though it's right-handed, the extended distance and a big field to guide him around. I am Maximus always jumped left last year. And Paul gave him a bit of mastery to win it. I think he don't know who could possibly be doing the same with the Irish National if he was mine. I'll be honest, we both just winced at each other, Ruby and I. I'd hate to lead him up in the Irish National, Would let you? alone ride him. Oh, <laughs> torture, Ruby. But at least those, that, those victories on Flooring Porter erase the time where your mum beat you in the Albert Bartlett. Yes, but, uh, you know, everybody talks about, oh, how hard was it for my mother to beat me in the Albert Bartlett. I think it was the happiest I ever was in defeat. Uh, you know, swinging in here, new Milchon and keep galloping. Ryan Cooper was looking for a gap that probably wasn't there. That was closed, and we we locked horns down to the last. Martello Tower, he was a good, tough horse. I'd obviously had the job with Barry Connell the year before, mm. but Barry had given me the ride on Martello Tower after I'd been sacked at Christmas uh, to win on him in Limerick, a good trial for the Albert Bartlett. Even away from the last, I thought, oh, I'm, I'm going to hang on, I'm going to get there. And he, he's just got the better of me. Adrian Heskin gave him a, a great ride to get up and win. And, you know, I suppose I was just young and naive and thought the Cheltenham winners are going to come for me. And delighted for my mother, who would probably only have 10, maybe 15 a, a maximum race horses in the yard. It'd be mainly young horses to sell would be her thing. So for her to be a Cheltenham Festival winning trainer was fantastic. Mm. Now, Danny, when you knock someone down, you have to be definite about it. There definitely wasn't a gap. Not probably wasn't a gap. <laughs> there was no gap there. Exactly. Be definite about it. <laughs> this might come up again. Let's talk about your rides this year, shall we? Should we start with Ilete Tom? Ruby, are you going to give your analysis of the, of the horse first? Yeah, and I'll be honest. I, when he was going to go chase him, I didn't think this horse even looked like resembled or would be a chaser. So he surprised me from where go when he won in Thurlis with Paul. Um, Torres very fast track I think if you jump around Torres there's a fair chance you'll jump anywhere after that he beats Oh My Lord and Aspire Tower and it was a good performance I didn't think he was a chaser he looked a natural that day Paul rode him and Danny has ridden him um, on his couple of starts since and obviously he went to Limerick at Christmas two miles and three was too far for him but here he is in the Irish arc and Danny this race to me he pings the third last pings the second last it was a sprint. It was an end to end. The arc of next week is going to be a completely different race. Do you think that this race getting down to speed suited him? I don't think so. I think his jumping kept him in the position I wanted to be before the sprint started. Maybe Fasal Vega softened, found a 50 before I lay down a true challenge to him at the back of the last. But 
the fact that he won at the Dublin Festival the year before when Fasal Vega and High Definition went a great gallop on the front end and he really ground out that day. I think the way the Arkel is usually run will suit him. He jumps quite well. He jumped great down the back in Leopardstown and you'll need to do that to be in with a competitive chance in the Arkel coming down the hill. Fingers crossed he'll come home well. I certainly think, given the way he's taken defences, he obviously gives them more respect than he did hurdles. He seems to be more straightforward and, and settling a lot better. I think many people might have the doubt about Cheltenham itself, because he's been there twice, hasn't he, for the Triumph and for the Supreme, but for different reasons, he's been beaten. What are your thoughts about that? Yeah, he got himself beat in the Triumph, and I got him beat in the Supreme. don't think he probably could have won either race, but he was too keen as a juvenile in the triumph, and I was in the wrong position on him in the supreme. He so this is him in the triumph? In the green and red down the inside, you'll see that one absolutely pulling a roller. He could do that when he was younger, and the hood has definitely helped him. The thing I took away from the triumph, he pulls like he's pulling now until he was down over the second last. He was absolutely burning petrol. Yeah, but he's matured from that. And then obviously you say you got him beaten the Supreme last year, but look, he missed the fourth last, and the fourth last hurdle is just the wrong hurdle to miss. It's the wrong hurdle to miss, and, you know, I, I chased my position there, but I think for how they went in the early part of the race, I should have been three or four lengths closer. Uh, in Leopardstown, I jumped off, bang with the leaders, and they galloped away from me at a strong speed. I thought I'd take cover in Cheltenham and let them go to gallop. They didn't go to gallop. I'm in the wrong position. And still ran with credit to finish fifth. Like, you know, I, I'm up in the position now, but having used petrol at the wrong part of the race, everybody around me, every horse in the field realistically has a chance at this point. And I suppose Marine National was the one who had the class to go and pick up and win. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, yeah. Look, I, I'd be with you. I don't think that the Cheltenham Farm is necessarily against them, and I think the Ark will be a much different race. Different race. He's a mature horse, but I think he might have to go to beat Founder 50 myself. It's going to be strongly run, isn't it, Danny? With the likes of Matata and Quilixios there, it's going to be a very different race to the Irish Ark, or how it pans out. It will be, and I suppose that might be a slight negative for Founder 50 as well, where Jack's been very good on him this year, but Jack's been allowed to do what he's wanted with that extra pace in the Arkle. I hope it might soften up Founder 50 in the early fractions as well, but who knows until the day. Let's talk about Cargizi, shall we, and her chances in the triumph. Clearly, there's Sergino in the way, but she has got a high level of form in Ireland. She's very good. Her run in Leopardstown at Christmas was brilliant, considering how keen she was. And she went back here to the Dublin Festival. We changed plans. Myself and Willie had a chat beforehand. She settled going down to the start and settled throughout the race. Got a good jump at the second last. Uh, was in front down to the last, had a little look at it, but ran out a good winner. You know, they're probably all the Irish ones are on top of each other mm. going to the line there. But I think there's a bit more strength and depth to that form where Sergino is visually impressive. Hopefully when we get to test him, we will get close to him anyway, maybe beat him. Well, I mean, there is the doubt about how Nicky Henderson's team are going. Constitution Hill is going to turn up, which is something we're going to talk about later on in the show. He's had a spate of pulled ups as well. So. Yeah, but I'd be, I suppose Jericho de Rapine, Berico Lord, uh, horses like that, I'd be more interested in. And you'll have collateral for him by the time you get to Sergino on Friday. Where you are, yeah. You'll know where you are, so I wouldn't be jumping up and down about it just now. But, like, Danny, there's every chance Bunting, Stormhat, or Mansborough could flip that with Cargisi. Like, do you think they're four champions or are they much of a muchness? It's never great when you see them in a bunch. I suppose Marshborough is the one you'd have to take out of the race, having his first run, a big horse, ran a little bit keen. 
as did Cargis for her to step up and win the Spring Juvenile in Leperstown. So my heart is ruling my head on this one. I don't <laughs> think Cargis was a winning chance. She wore a tongue tie in France. Has there been any chat about that going back on? I don't think so. Um, I've I've ridden her work at home since, and she she hasn't wore one, so I, I don't think she will. She doesn't need it. Willie's gallop would be a fair test of one's win, and he seems to be fine there. Okay. Should we move on to Gallimarceau, who ran second to Lossiemouth in the Triumph last season? That gives her a chance, given that we know that Gallimarceau stays further. Really good start to the season. Not so good last time. That's it in one. You know, last year we were lucky to beat Lossie Mout at the Dublin Festival, went on to France and won quite well over two and a half. And I was thinking then, give me a go at Lossie Mout over two and a half. <laughs> she had a good start to the season in Doncaster. I thought all she'd have to do is hack round here in Punchestown. And I'm turning into the straight on Say La Vie. I see it's Dara on my outside turning in. Uh, well, i got to concentrate on winning here, but pulling up, I was wondering, where is Paul? That was just disappointing. It's taking the wind out of her sails. No better man now than Willie to get one back, but after the Punchestown run, oh, it's just disappointing. That was the heaviest ground she's encountered. Could it be anything like that? Possibly so, and... The inside track, which that race was run on in Punchestown, like Fairy House, the inside track in Punchestown, it's a different level of deep ground. So I'm hoping that that might have been a factor, but it's going to be on the soft side in Cheltenham too. And who knows? I just hope she bounces back to something like the spark that she showed me in Doncaster. But we're, we're trying to pick up the pieces more so than going with confidence. That Triumph form does give her a chance, though. I mean, the Triumph form does, but uh, I'm trying to think that is the Cui Viga hurdle. Cui Viga won it, Annie Power won it a furlong. Uh, Limini beat Apple's Jade, but Apple's Jade didn't get beaten as far as Gallimars O did. That would definitely be a concern for me, that run. Mm. No doubt. If we think about the Albert Bartlett, Danny, you, obviously you won the Nathaniel Lacey on Dancing City. Are you clear about where, whether you'll be riding Dancing City or another horse in the Albert Bartlett? Just to be clear on one thing, I don't know what rides, if any, I have to <laughs> ride for Willie Mullins. <laughs> you can't blame um, me for trying, Daddy. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'd love to ride him again. He, he was good and he was good at the Dublin Festival, progressive through the year. His first run left a lot to be desired, stepped up to win his maiden and stepped up to win a grade one as a 20 to one outsider of the field. Um, I think there was a few behind him. Jatara, the mayor, had solid runs and Predators Gold had a good run behind Calvin Potter at Christmas. So I think there was no fluke about this race at the Dublin Festival. He hit the line quite strong. The extra few furlongs, I don't think, will be any issue. And he's quite a relaxed old character. So I think he, he fits the right profile for the Albert Bartlett. But quite often, it's the ones away from the head of the market that seem to win it. I don't know why that is, but I don't think I'd swap this fella uh, for many more in the race. No, but those three of Willie's at the top of the market, obviously, this fella reading Tommy wrong and high class hero. High -class hero they're all very relaxed horses. I mean, none of the three of them exactly blow you away at home. They're all quite relaxed. So, in a way, they all fit the profile, and that could be a difficult one for Paul to pick. Hopefully, it is going to be difficult for Paul to pick. But, uh, <laughs> like you see with Mill Sean a few years ago, one's at 33 to 1 can pop up in this race. High class hero. Which is the 33 to 1 charge you're trying to tell us then? I don't know if there's one in it this year. <laughs> I, I think High Class Hero, he's notched up a few wins. He, he didn't get too far clear of the horses in Furless. I was third on another one of Willie's, I forget his name, that day. And, yeah, I I just hope, yeah, Paul doesn't want to ride Danson City, the fact that he disappointed him at, at the first uh, his first run of the season this year. So, a good look, I can get back on him and give them something to think about. What do you think your options might be in the Gallagher bearing Bingham now that uh, Willie Mullins has, on, on Thursday, said that Ballybird is running in the longer race? I mean, he hasn't waited to Sunday. What's going on, Danny? 
Well, I think it's the only one that I've got right at all the previews. Everybody was saying that uh, Ballyburn is going to go for the Supreme. And I was saying, no, he'll go for the Baron Bingham now, the Gallagher Novice Hurdle. Looking through the rest of those, I think Predator's Gold dropping down a furlong and probably a stronger run race than it was at the Dublin Festival. Can he settle it? Give him, it would give him a big chance of winning the race. And an outsider of a, one of Willie's at a huge price still is Mercury. He was very good in a maiden hurdle for me. I'd give him an each way chance. I don't know if you could say he'll win the race, but at 50 to 1, you could see him finishing in the top three. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, I, wrote him, I wrote him down myself because I forget that. <laughs> <laughs> There's so many. I mean, uh, William Manners has, has got so many. Has he? He's got nine of the 15 in the Supreme, 13 of the 24 left in the Gallagher. He could run six in the Supreme and probably six or seven in the Gallagher as well, yeah. Mm. But he'll run them. Certainly will. We can rely on him for that. Uh, Miss Manzor, maybe, for the, for the Dawn Run, for the Ryanair Dawn Run? She'd have her chance. She won in Fairy House, was it? She beat uh, Karina the Blasses, I, I think, if it's uh, right. She's a juvenile as well. Does she still have an entry in the Triumph? But I'm sure the, the mayor's oh, no. novice... It, I'm, I'm getting my wrong race, aren't I? You're right. She's in the Boodles Fred Winter, and I've, I've mixed my races up. You're spot on. For, for once, I've got one over on you, Lydia. <laughs> we time next week. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> You'll pay for that. That's why I stay quiet. That's why I stay quiet over here. I knew she was in the boodles too, but your card is marked, Daniel. Honestly, Gary, go on, carry on, carry on, Danny. Yeah, yeah, she she was good. You know, she did she get beat? I think the first run this year and won quite well that day in Fairy House. But maybe that form might need to step up a level to be good enough to beat the likes of uh, Brighter Days Ahead and Jay the Grugy. Brighter Days Ahead was probably a, a stronger run race in Navin for her, where Jade Grugy quickened very well in Fairy House to win with Brian Hayes on her last start. So that would be a, a good matchup between the pair of those. What about meeting at the waters then? Had he 17 pounds in hand to Paddy Power? He was good there, yeah. And uh, oh, hopefully he, he'd have his chance in the ultimate. He has his penalty, but uh, I think yeah, that, he, he's... Daniel, that wasn't the question I asked you. Had he 17 pounds in hand? I think he did. You're going to have to explain. No, no, that Lou. That's grand if you think because he's gone up 17 pounds to win and he won this off 130. He's running off 147 on uh, Tuesday. So if he didn't have 17 pounds in hand, he's not going to win on Tuesday. That's what I was thinking. I was doing the maths for the penalty, but like he did win well. But these are hardened handicappers, Danny James de Verle, Bustledon, adamantly chosen, Panda Boy in against novices. Will it be a different ball game for him on Tuesday? I suppose uh, the thing for a novice, does he jump well enough? And he jumped brilliant around Leopardstown. I know he unseated at the first, but that was no fault of his. The next day, a, a loose horse uh, or one fell in front of him again. Mm. Right, he has no chance. I, I thought he, he won very well. Panda Boy was laid out for the race and he's ran away from the rest of them. I think he's deserving of his penalty uh, and he'd go to the ultimate with a big chance again. Yeah, now he's been bought by J.P. McManus, hasn't he? He's still yeah. in the National Hunt Chase, but they've obviously got Corbett's Cross for that, so the Ultima, he's now hard. And ultima, and he's, the ultima, he's in the National as well, so yeah. Ultima, and I suppose that's where he's going. I'm fully aware of his, uh, his National Entry. I'm just, I'm just, you know, it's been polite. <laughs> on Steve, might she turn up for the Mrs. Paddy Power? She could do. She had a nice comeback early in the year in Tom Mel and probably disappointed in Fairy House and maybe disappointed me a little bit in Nace over a trip probably shorter than her best. She's beaten Ali Gorda Bassi last year and was second to Impervious in Punchestown, but mm. on her recent form, I think she needs to step up again. But later in the spring last year, she got to a higher level. Nace, a bit like Gallimar so in Punchestown, Nace, for instance, disappointed me somewhat. Yeah, I agree. She started so well at Clonmel, I thought you were going to have a good season. And there is that form at the back end of last season. There is. She just hasn't and gone on. No, and she seemed to turn the corner quickly in the spring last year, so maybe she could, whereas Gallimar saw was very consistent as a juvenile. Anstey had lost the way and, and turned it back, so she probably could more so, in my mind, than Gallimar saw. Now, Willie probably thinks the opposite and he knows best. 
Are you feeling that Il Etiton is your strongest chance, Danny? If I were to get on him, I think he'd have a big chance. His form is solid all the way through the year. It's a very competitive article. I suppose you can make a realistic case for three or four of them in it. But the improvement he showed through the year, I'd love to write him in it. I think he could go there with a, a big chance. OK, well, I hope you are on board. I hope you've got plenty of other very good rides, and no doubt you will have for, with that yard and how many excellent chances they'll be taking over. Danny, thank you very much for sparing the time to chat to us this evening. Good luck next week. Thank you very much. Cheers, Dan. If I get to ride, if I get to ride, that's the problem. When you're, when you're, a stable is that dominant, dominant, and they've got that many horses, dominant in terms of achievement and dominant in terms of numbers, you know, that everything has got to sort of shuffle around Paul Townend, really, hasn't it? And what he decides to do, apart from the retained riders. Yeah, but, yeah, apart from, like, obviously, Mark with JP yeah. and, and Daryl maybe with a couple of um, Simon Manier and Isaac Swades. But, yeah, and to be fair, you know, Danny is on, on the second rung and Willie's and Patrick will ride a couple as well. Mm. And it's not a bad job to have either, though. No, well. And Willie won't put any pressure on Paul to make decisions because in Willie's mind, he'll be thinking, I'll get the horses there first and then I'll worry about who's riding them on Sunday. So there's no... Whereas you would have seen in other yards, trainers putting pressure on, owners wanting to know who's, where am I running and who's riding it. Like, Willie just about tell the owners where they're running and who's riding it, he'll worry about that when the declarations are done Sunday. And then the rides trickle around to whoever else. But in fairness to Willie, he's very good to keep those rides internal between Danny, Patrick, Brian Hayes, Mikey O'Sullivan, Sean O'Keefe, Rachel Blackmore comes in and rides out as well. And a lot of the rides will stay amongst those riders. Well, it's such a strong stable of jockeys. Why would you complain? I know, exactly, but he does. And, you know, th that's a big help. Mm, very much so. Let's chat about what news has been going on, shall we? We began at the start of the show talking about Ballyburn and how that decision has been made that he goes for the Gallagher bearing Bingham rather than the Supreme. He also added, Willie Mullins, he said that of his, what would I say, nine, yes, nine currently in the Supreme, the two that are definitely going there are Tully Hill and Mythical Power. Tell Tully Hill had no other entry. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So tell me how... That was good of him to come out, get off the fence on that one. Tell me how, to, how that all was worked out. What, what, if it, from your point of view, you know how the process works. You would have been on, you know, even more on the inside of the process when you were on Paul, in Paul Tannen's shoes, in that, you know, you would have had a, a dog in the fight, essentially, about where you wanted the horse to go. Um, and Paul would be the same, and it would have come down to, do you, which of these do you want to ride? And in Willie's mind, Ballyburn had the option of going both races, so then Paul had to decide, well, do I think Tully Hill will win, or I think Eid Atlantique will win? And that's ultimately what it will come down to. And um, yeah, and I suppose if you look at it from Willie's point of view, he has Mystical Power, Tully Hill, uh, there's two of Simon and Isaacs another way, and Mr. Giff. Um, you know, I think Willie is a strong hand, and then he is obviously Eid Atlantique and Ballyburn in the, in the two and a half. So it gives him a strong hand there as well. Asian Master could go to boat races, Tom Costello will ride him, and mm -hmm. that would be a great story too. But Willie is strong, and uh, he's really trying to give himself the strongest chance he can to win. Both races. And the Albert Bartlett. So you're pushing a couple from the Bering Bingham to the Albert Bartlett. So trying to. Definitely. So did it come down to is Tully Hill's jumping good enough? In many ways. Yeah, I'd basically. imagine it would have. And I'd say, even looking back at him, we questioned his jumping here on this show at Punchestown where he was quite hesitant. But when you compare Punchestown to Nace to Punchestown, there was improvement every day. Now he has to improve again. He'll have to take another mile an hour off how much speed he loses if he's going to win a Supreme, but um, he's a very, very good racehorse, Tully Hill. Mystical Power, the, that hotness that we saw prior to the Moscow Flyer, is that, was that a determining factor? Because he did have the choice between that and the, and the longer race. Would, would, would that be...? Yeah, but to me, looking at them, Ballyborn races with his head down and kind of races on the bridle, I would have said Mystical Power was a much keener horse. Mystical Power can be quite free. He was keen in Punchestown, so to me, going two and a half at Mystical Power was always going to be difficult. He's, he is, he's keen, he's buzzy, and look, who knows, maybe he'll handle the, the preliminaries for the Supreme, he'll take it all in his stride, but um, you know, his mother was a bit in her toes, and I'm not sure about Galileo. Uh, I think he was fine, he passed the derby test, didn't he? He did, yeah. In, in some style. Uh, Ballyburn himself, 
immediately after he won at the Dublin Racing Festival, you and I were both of the instinct that he's a supreme type horse. Is there any vulnerability to him in what could potentially be a steadily run race over further? No, because if it's steadily run, you can just make the running on him. Um, he'll canter along in front. Um, and that low head carriage? It, I don't think he's that. Paul doesn't think he's that keen. Mm. And he's the one ultimately up on his back. And that's the way he carries his head. But I, to me, you need to turn a foot to win. Uh, bearing Bingham. And I think he showed it when he was bypassing the last hurdle at, at Leperstown. I think he quickened there and put a couple of lengths between himself and Slade Steele. So I'd have no worries about that either. Yeah, I'm, I, I, I tend to agree. I mean, he, he's got the dominant... With Caldwell Potter not turning up at the festival, he has the dominant novice hurdling form, hasn't he? He does, season? but... The other side of that kind is, and look, obviously I have one foot in the camp and you think he's a dominant one and he will win. I have watched, saw and ridden against loads of hot pot novices that got stuffed. <laughs> and Slade Steele, Henry de Bromhez has maintained that he will run in whichever race Ballyburn doesn't. So does that mean we're going to see Slade Steele in the Supreme? Yeah, possibly, but I'd say it's easy enough to argue he's a better horse going a bit further. I think so too, yeah. OK. Uh, other news. Today, as he said he would, Gordon Elliott supplemented American Mike for the brand advisory. So stepping Another up to three miles. Another reason for Dan Skelton to go two and a half. <laughs> <laughs> this is after his win in the turn up. Yeah, and here he is beating Nick Rocket and Manila Cook Cooner. Um, and he looks like he's getting a bit empty going to the last year. But to be fair to American Mike, he jumps it well, lands and keeps going all the way to the line. So, yeah. He beats Fact to File in the beginner's chase at Navin, which is solid for me, disappointed in Limerick at Christmas. I wouldn't blame any horse for that. Some horses handle that ground in Limerick, some don't. Mm -hmm. I think Noble Yates is a classic example of a horse who doesn't handle heavy ground in Limerick at Christmas. So you can say the same for American Mike. But um, look, he's a very good horse, and you know, Gordon thinks enough of him to stick him in there and pay the supplementary fee. You'd have to respect it. Yes, and so we've got Broadway Boy in there as well, haven't we, rather than the National Hunt Chase. Yeah, and Stay Away Fay, and I think that's a, that's a pretty deep race. I know you've got a four to five favourite, in fact, to file, but Broadway Boy, Stay Away Fay, really strong stairs. They'll go a good gallop, which will suit American Mike, in fact, to file, but both are really going to have to show their stay, I think, to get by Stay Away Fay. Yeah, I, I tend to agree. I mean, Broadway Boy being there is really good news for Stay Away Fay, I think. I think the same. I think it's music to Paul Nichols' ears, I'd say. I think he has one that's going to drag him. And it's but going one, to... Sorry, I'm one of the ability, Lydia, to drag you a long way. He's not going to just bring you to halfway. Broadway boy is going to bring stay away Faye as far as how you covered him once. And with fact of file, the thing that we don't know we, know, we know from the clock that he's brilliant, but he does adjust right and he's on a tightly turning left-handed track and we don't know whether a slog is going to bring out the best of him at this stage in his career. No, but I'd be surprised... I will be surprised if Mark Walsh gets involved in the slog. We'll be thinking more about this on Monday. That's when our uh, festival preview show for Road to Cheltenham, the last one of the series ahead of Cheltenham, will be. We'll give you more details of that at the end of the show. Um, other news. We've got eight standing their ground in the Betway Queen Mother Champion Chase. The, what, the key horse that's been taken out is Editor de Gite. Um I wouldn't be surprised to see all eight stay in. I thought six. I can't remember what two I thought might come out. But when you're left in at this stage, you'd have to think so. But look, it's... It's about the big three and the rest, isn't it? Mm -hmm. uh, El Fabiolo, John Vaughan, Edward Stone. It'd be interesting to see what the weather's like, what the ground is like, um, and what the tactics are with Edward Stone. But look, this fella sets the standard. Do you think he'd be four to nine on the day? I think he'd be shorter. Do you? Yeah. Ooh. Why? Because well, what's the angle against him, really? I mean, I suppose a lot of it, I think, will probably depend on what happens on day one with Nicky Henderson's team. I think that will have an impact on whether people want to back John Bon or not. I just think 13 fences at 34 or 5 miles an hour. I'd want a bit more than want the tree anyway. <laughs> a little bit has been made in the Racing Post about Nico de Boinville saying that he doesn't think that in one of the many preview shows on the circuit, he, that he doesn't think that the... Um, El Fabio's jumping is all that. Uh, presumably, it's been put to him about John Bond's jumping as well. But, I mean, I think we can all see what Nico's talking about. In, certainly, as a novice, he had the propensity thro to throw in a big, mis big mistake, albeit never looking like falling. No, exactly. And he wasn't foot perfect in Leprechaun on his last start. He wasn't foot perfect in Cork either. He does rub one, he can hit one. Someday that's going to catch him out, but thus far it hasn't. Yeah, you've always said, though, he keeps his bum low, doesn't he? He, he gets does, his... but... Funnily enough, somewhere along the way, Lydia, 
the island up on the floor. Stuff can happen, can't it? Um, other news, the Grand Daniel. We heard about uh, Dan Skelton's hopes for an expected party for that race. Harry Cobden has been booked for Liberty Hunter for Evan Williams. Adam Wedge, of course, had that um, schooling fall. He's damaged three vertebrae in his back. He's out until May. That happened in January. And Harry gets on board Liberty Hunter. This is a good ride to pick it up. It is a good ride, isn't it? Um, hard luck on Adam Wedge. Vertebrae are slow. But, um, yeah, this is a good ride for Harry's, Harry Cobden. Mm. A horse that... Go on. Oh, go on, sorry. I had well, the wrong Harry there for a second. No, no, you got the right Harry. <laughs> uh, this horse beats Matata, who runs in the Arkle, I think, or run well in, in the Arkle. And think, this horse did well to run him down. He did, and I think Mat and he, at Liberty Hunter's mark has been well-minded. And Matata adds spice to the Arkle because Matata likes to bowl along and there'd be no hiding place in that either. I think Liberty Hunter just does enough as well. Yeah. Handicapper's nightmare, Liberty Hunter. Just yeah, just Adam Wedge has been necessary. very good in Liberty Hunter, though. He's just sneaking up without getting a couple of pounds he doesn't need. Definitely. Job done. Um, conflated, he has been taken out of the Glenn Flarkless cross-country chase. It's Gordon Elliott nil, Michael O'Leary one. He runs in the Ryanair, like Michael wanted him to. It's 2-1, isn't it? Is it? Yeah, did he not fall in the Ryanair when Gordon wanted to run him in the Gold Cup? Then he ran in the Gold Cup last year, now he's back in the Ryanair. It's 2-1, Lydia. It'll be 2-2 next year when he runs across country. To be fair, Gordon did say that given that there are so many, so much heaviness on the cross-country yeah. course still, that he didn't really think that that would suit conflated. No, but 2-1. <laughs> right. OK, now we have another guest joining us on the phone, and that is David Christie, who has three really interesting entries in the St James's Place Hunter Chase. David, are you there? Yes, I'm here, Lydia. Thank Good you evening. very much for joining us. You're yeah, very welcome. You're very welcome. And you know Ruby, of course. You used to know each other very well. Yeah, don't uh, know yeah, David I know very Ruby. well. Uh, proper Hunter yeah. Chase man. Absolutely. Can we talk about your three then? Uh, Ferns Lock, Ramelies and Vorsale. Um, but maybe we'll start with Ferns Lock, the seven-year-old. There's been, it's been no secret that this horse is a huge talent and he has the results to match as well. Yeah, he's, he's a very good horse and, and um, he's a very strong horse and he, he's got loads of class uh, and plenty of speed as well. Um, I suppose we, at this stage, he's done everything that we would like him to do, but at this stage, uh, we're unsure about uh, three mile two mm. um, up the hill at Cheltenham, you know? Mm. I, I, can, I can see that. We're going to have a look at him finishing second behind It's on the Line, with Ramelies behind in fourth and Vosselet in fifth. But I take your point about, about the trip. Obviously, Ferns Rock Lock has since come out and went at Thurles, but does he kind of look ideal for Aintree rather than Cheltenham? Perhaps, David. Well, uh, I would say that's probably right, and Ruby has told me that as well. So, <laughs> and who, who, who can argue with Ruby? But at the same time, it's Cheltenham, and and you get a chance to go to Cheltenham. I don't want to be one of those people that sits wondering. I wonder, mm. you know. Um, but at the same time, at Christmas, my horses were under all under a bit of a cloud. Uh, nothing was running right then. Uh, we rode him wrongly. We learned it. We learned more about him that day than we'd had all his runs, really. And we sort of moved forward from there. And we used um, his ability uh, at Thurles, and he has come on from Thurles. And I think he's well. We think he's the best we've had, which is not maybe the same as the big yards. You know, would have had the really top horses. But as far as we're concerned, we think he's he's the best hunter chaser we've had. I still that, think that's something of a statement, isn't it? That is a huge statement. When you look, David, at the level of hunter chasers you've had, open lightweight horses, you have a line into Premier Magic, you're at this a long time. Like, you're saying he's a better seven-year-old maybe than Vossele was, the best you had. Like, you must be getting confidence. No, no, I'm never confident. As you know, Ruby, I'm not one of those kind of people. But, um, you know, Billaway looked as well as ever. I've seen him at Nace. Uh, in his last run there, and um, but he, I don't think it was Patrick's plan to be where he was, uh, to come from where he was, and uh, we sort of, sort of thought with we'll, Vermelis, we'll push a few buttons here and see where the weaknesses are of everybody else, you know, and it's on the line. Well, he'll definitely need Derek O'Connor, 
because I don't I think if Derek O'Connor wasn't on him, he wouldn't be the same horse um that we see, you know. And he's another horse who has to to come from a wee bit back. I'd imagine Premier Magic is I don't see why people forget him because mm. I think he's probably like Bradley gives us a good lad and knows how to train. He won it last year. Why would anybody reverse the form on him unless he has regressed a wee bit, you know? So when you see Vat Vosley last year, he went to Cheltenham and he, we didn't realise it at the time, but he came home sick and he's only beaten 10 lengths. Um, I'd be very disappointed if Fern Strock wasn't better than 10 lengths there. Yeah. You know. We can take a look at Vorsalet finishing seventh last year in the Fox Hunters. And that's interesting, the line in that you've got with Vorsalet versus Ferns Lock. And as you say, Premier Magic, he, he won this tidily. Um, Vorsalet was a bit keen, would that be fair this time around? Well, he was, but uh, it was more that he was sick and he got a, a, quite a rough passage, as you do, um, in the Fox Hunters. And but at the same time, you know, he's not beaten that far, but I, I don't, he's a very good hunter chaser. I think he's won about five and most of his forms from better ground, but I just don't see him in the same class as this horse. But maybe Ruby's right, maybe he's too classy for the female too. And sometimes, very often it's a doer out and out stare that, uh, that wins this race, you know. I just think he's the most magnificent jumper, David. I mean, I watched him at Down Royal at Turles, watched him last year as a six-year-old when you weren't going to bring in the child. Like, he just, he's the kind of horse that when he spots a fence, he goes. And I'd love if there was three or, more, four, three or four more fences for him from the top of the hill home. Yeah, so, uh, so Barry, so would Barry. Um, Barry says he loves to shuffle. Uh, yes, you even know what that means. <laughs> he, he's not a horse who just goes and stands off. He loves to shuffle and move his feet. For a big horse, he's very nimble that way, touch wood. And his jumping has always been very good in English schools here, maybe 100 fences a week, you know, uh, in my arena here. So that would be one of his strengths. And I suppose if the ground was to dry up a wee bit and we had nice ground, obviously he goes in the heavy ground, but he will go on a nice bit of ground. Um, he's not restricted to heavy ground. I think it would act, nice ground would sit him better then it would sit um, uh, it's on the line in Billaway, who are probably take a wee while to get into gear, you know. And when Ramalee's ran against it's on the line in Billaway, there was a point at the second last where he looked the likeliest winner, didn't he? Had he just done a bit too much? Well, I, I looked at it afterwards uh, and I chatted with Maxine. Maxine it was for, Maxine's first ride actually back after having uh, an injury. And uh, I was watching the, the speed in the bottom corner of the screen, and you could see about the third last around the bottom, you know, before you turn into the straight river there. Mm. Uh, Derek knew that the thing was, the pace had been too quick. But I had said, obviously, to Maxine, you know, force the pace, uh, just force it and see where we stand. And the speed actually uh, was in around 29 miles an hour there. And Derek, he eased off, and then Ramirez went up to 31 mile an hour, mm. just at the wrong time. And, you know, as Maxine said afterwards, she had to ride it again, she probably would have sat in. But that was my fault. That wasn't Maxine's fault, you know. And then when he folded, then he, he did fold. But she luckily looked behind her and saw nothing was coming. And it's a kind of false impression to have 40-something lengths, beating 40-something lengths, because in truth, if it had been a different situation, they probably would have been beaten 20 lengths, you know? In, in terms of jockey bookings for the Hunter's Chase, have you decided with, you've got Barry O'Neill, obviously, you've got Maxine, you've got Rob James. How does it all shake down? Well, it shakes down from a point of view. Um, and again, Ruby, I'll know this. Like, you'd have to be dragging him off with a pitchfork or something to get him off Fern's Lock. Mm. So that's his choice, you know. Uh, there'll be nobody to get on him other than Barry. Um, that's the way Barry wants it. So that says something for Ferns Lock. Um, for, as regards Vosley, I may, I might be tempted to put Maxine on him because uh, Maxine would work on him after that was time the other day there. 
just a nice leg stretch, nothing, nothing serious. And I thought he was very happy with her. And uh, Romilis uh, probably robbed James. But I, I, put, uh, I declared Romilis for uh, the Tetra team on Garn on Saturday. But that wouldn't stop him going to Cheltenham. Um, but I just thought the, the Tetra team on Garn deserved uh, to be patronised a wee bit more. You know, and if I hadn't declared him in it, it would have been just ordinary enough, you know. Mm. And how much would you like to win this race? I hesitate to bring this up because I know that you probably haven't watched it back, and why would you? The 2022 Fox Hunters, wing leader, you and Barry O'Neill, six lengths clear at the last, and then being run down by a certain bill away. What are your memories yeah. of this day? Pride. That's, uh, that's what I remember of that day. Uh, pride in my horse and pride in everybody that was surrounded the horse to get him there. What a great answer. Um, the, you know, I, I, it's a very cold evening up the north here and the minute cold and dull and almost black. And uh, it takes me back to the, the day that John Thomas fell in, in Cheltenham. And we were all standing waiting to see how the whole thing was working out outside the weigh room. And it was that kind of a day. And when you leave Cheltenham after a day like that there, I tell you, getting beat up the hill at Cheltenham is not really that important, you know. Mm. I, I'd be delighted for Barry O'Neill. I think he deserves it. He top off his career, kind of career, a bit of like a cream in the cake for Barry to win that race. And I'd be delighted for my family. But I don't see myself, I don't mark myself uh, that it will define me whether I win at Cheltenham or not. Although I, w I will feel that I will have let Ferns Lock down if I don't. Well, we are in no doubt whatsoever about the regard in which you hold Fern's lock. Um, but we wish you luck with all three of them, David. Thank you very much for joining us this evening. We really appreciate your insight and those powerful words, particularly at the end. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lydia. Thank and you. Nice to look. Very much so. Um, Some man, isn't he? Very much so. Just that's the that's the first time I've actually chatted to him. I think what a remarkable human being he class. clearly is. Pure class. Yeah, absolutely. OK, uh, there's more to come, but first we're going to take a break. It's funny, though, <laughs> I, I actually went through the race a lot in my head before and then I kind of knew what was going to happen. Yeah. Like I knew David was going to jump and go because he'd done the same in Leprous yeah. uh, and. I had a feeling what was going. Ruby was going to follow me one side, and Barry was going to follow me the other side, and that's literally how it played out. And it was actually like a piece of work. Yeah. I rode him as if like David was. I didn't want to give him too much of it, of leeway, leeway, and I was just trying to judge my bit of pace. And it was literally like riding a piece of work with yeah. jumps in front of you. That's I was just so comfortable the whole way through. Yeah, I never came out of third gear. Now, what does it feel like to be, you know, not, not a J.P. McMahon, it's not a Rich Ritchie, not someone who's, you know, used to having a battalion of runners at the Cheltenham Festival and going with a chance, and you might be disappointed if you don't win. What does it, what does it feel like to be a more of a attainable type owner and be going to the Cheltenham Festival with a right chance? Well, we can ask some of the members of the Good Stock Syndicate who, of course, have got Dysart Enos running in the Mayor's Novices Hurdle, the Dawn Run sponsored by Ryanair. Ben and Stephen Goodman are joining us now. Hi, uh, Welcome. Ben on the left, Stephen on the right. Great to that you are joining us. Thank you very much. Great to see you. How excited are you on a scale of 1 to 10? 11. <laughs> <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> uh, tell, now, now, Ben, you're the one that got your dad into this horse. Tell us the story, because this is a... This is a classic thing, and I think we should be encouraging for racing and encouraging for everybody out there, because you started with a certain Pentland Hills. Yeah, that's right. So, um, what, four, five years ago, uh, one of my best friends who loves his racing too said, uh, shall we get a share in one of the syndicates? And, uh, yeah, I ended up picking Pentland Hills. Uh, so that... Uh, that worked out all right. And I remember Dad saying after he won the Triumph, how have you managed to get a grade one winner with your, your first horse? <laughs> um, so as I say, it's easy, isn't it? Um, <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, from there, um, obviously, Dad's had some in the past. And he's kind of um, 
picked it back up again uh, with one of his one of his good friends as well, uh, Nick. So we kind of formed a, a such a syndicate off there. But really, there's just yeah, it's a family. It's a family and friends syndicate. It's a quite closed, but yeah, it's it's a good vehicle. I mean, the, all the syndicates work well. The, as Ben's just said, the big syndicates lets a lot of people get a chance of owning a racehorse and the thrill of it. Uh, and this one, I just wanted to see if we could get a Saturday horse, as everybody says, uh, to end up with one as good as this. And we're so lucky because, in truth, if the point to point had ended differently, she made a horrendous mistake and it was never shown on the video. And she was a closing um, second. And Willie Mullins went and bought the winner uh, for a price we couldn't afford. <laughs> and we ended up being able to afford the runner up. And the rest is history. And Ben, this was your choice, wasn't she, Dysatinas? Yeah, so uh, when it came to the sales, uh, typically I would do like a short list of horses that I like, and then Fergal and Sally will do uh, their short list. And if it kind of marries up, uh, um, then we take it uh, sort of another look at them. And uh, yeah, we got, got Dice out, luckily. If you want to swap her for that, for fancy girl, there's no problem. I'll, I'll organise it. <laughs> if, you'd like, if you'd like her now, no, we, we, can arrange, we can arrange that. I think they're going to stick. <laughs> are they? <laughs> I think they are. Yeah. Let's take a look at her exploit, shall we? I'm going to take you back to Aintree, first of all. Tell us about this day when she won this grade two mare's bumper. I mean, like I think Virgil said, we were going into it and thinking, She's got something about her, but we didn't know what. And I think it was about this point here where I'd seen her sort of on the bridle come up alongside and I started shouting and then I think <laughs> Dad clocked. And then as she just came from here, I mean, we turned to each other after the race and said, I don't think we've ever had been cheering for your winner when before it's even crossed the line. Well, furlong out, you knew you'd won the race, yeah. It was an unbelievable feeling. And she went into that race with, you know, there was a lot of talk of Jolly Curlain and or there are a lot of decent horses in behind her, and she just put the race to bed, you know, in an instant. So you know, we still think she's got untapped potential, um, and we think she's a special horse. And I think, like I say, the other two at the head of the market, they're all the same in that sense of they've not been fully exposed yet. Um, but the interesting thing is that all the jockeys are saying they wouldn't change their horse for any others. So it's going to be a great race. And the great thing is, no one really knows what's going to happen until the day, and it makes it even more exciting. One of them's going to come out really well, yeah, and the other two, hopefully, will still uh, gain an advantage from being in the race, etc. within there, but it should be. I mean, it's not just them. I mean, Golden Ace, there's a lot of good horses in the race, but these three look like they're a bit special, and none of them... Do we, we don't know the potential of any of the three yet because they haven't been tested. There you were in the Wizards enclosure with Paddy Brennan, with Fergal O'Brien, the two of you. But also, was that was your partner? Was Nick Nick Bostock Nick, there as well? Yeah. yeah. So Nick was there in the sort of the, in the bright blue suit, um, ah. and uh, yeah, he almost got his leg taken off by Dysart afterwards. <laughs> she's she's not one to stand still uh, <laughs> after a race, and uh, yeah, missed missed his leg by a whisker. So. There's, uh, they've got a special relationship, those two. So t tell us about this season and how she's taken to hurdles. Take us through the journey of the season. Well, I think, obviously, we started off, and I know Virgil wanted to find a nice race for her just to, you know, get her first run into her. Um, and to be fair, obviously, it was very novice a lot of, you know, the jumps. But the one thing she did that she did last season's continue to is she just travelled through the race effortlessly. Um, and then jumping last, and I think then was the theme in the, the next two races, is her last hurdles the um, the best her best jump normally. Well, um, I think the Cheltenham race is very important. I think, first of all, it gives her experience of Cheltenham. Also, I mean, beat the bat isn't a bad horse. And the time of her race would have won most of these dawn runs, to be honest. It was soft going. But if you look at the soft going times of the winners of the last few years, that, that performance from Dysart would have been up there and most probably won most of those. Um, and that, this was the big turning point. That's when Fergal had said we were originally going to go for a listed race in Newbury. 
uh, which I think she would have won quite easily looking at how the race panned out. But what Fergal said is, let's try and avoid the £5 penalty. Mm. And that could end up being crucial on the day. Mm. Absolutely. So she will be receiving £5 from Brighter Days Ahead and Jade Degrigi. Given that you've just been nutted at Carlisle by a Shark Hanlon trained horse <laughs> earlier today, <laughs> that, by a neck with Mask Crusader, with Dr Donald McCain, that, those, those £5 could be quite handy. It could be, but we're hoping it will be. <laughs> it can't do us any harm, can it? I mean, if you have the choice of going into a race five pounds less than your opposition, you 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 take it. Mm. Yeah, and we we've taken a chance because we could have gone for the prize money and had a listed race, and everybody was said, oh, I mean, one of the criticisms is she hasn't won a listed hurdle race; she's won a listed bumper race, um, you know, graded bumper race. Um, but really, it was a planned policy. I mean, and I know she's not beaten a lot of quality horses, but it's still something when you've run against, I've worked it out, 67 horses and only two have got within seven lengths of her. Yeah, it's not bad. Ben, I'd, I'd say that you fully reconverted your father to horse racing. I, I think we could be... Well, I, was ne I was never out of horse yeah. racing. He was converting me to buying horses uh. yeah, again. <laughs> Ah, uh, <laughs> well, job done, I, I, I reckon. You were talking about the special relationship, you know, that Paddy Brennan has with the horse. What, uh, tell me more about that. I mean, you know, I think Paddy will always say when he gets on a horse that he, he's a bit sweet on that. Um, he'll tell you it straight away. Um, and, you know, he thinks a lot. He doesn't actually tell you a lot about him, um, but he, he's always, always been very keen on her. Um, and he, he thinks a lot of her and similar, you know, to Orson Ferg was there's something special about her and it's, it's being race by race. Um, but she's going there with, with every chance. Yeah. Well, we're definitely going to try and get that monkey off Fergal's back. He deserves a winner and mm. hopefully we, he's got some quality horses now and whether it's us, or whether it's Crambo or whether it's something else, he really is. He's a great chap. He's a really friendly trainer. He's very approachable. And he deserves this break. And I think mm. once he makes that break, yeah, I think the, I'm hoping the floodgates open for him. It would be fantastic. I remember asking him after Dysart Enos won at Cheltenham in December, you know, might you be tempted to go for the Supreme because she was entered in it? And he was sort of like, I haven't had my first Cheltenham Festival winner so far. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he was absolutely definite what he wanted to do. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we have said that to him. I did say to him, you've managed to get a really low rating handicap-wise. Why don't we go for a very big handicap instead? <laughs> and there was deadly silence down the phone when I said that. I was only joking. Yeah. And, and tell us what it's like. You know, the time is ticking down to the festival now. The excitement m must be building. The nerves, I'd imagine, must be building as well. It's totally different. I go to the festival every year, and normally I'm looking there and I'm thinking, of, yeah, all of a sudden I'm thinking to myself, I'm really not bothered about the first two days like I normally am. Um, I'm just thinking about the Thursday. Everything revolves around the Thursday. Normally I'm planning what I'm going to bet and do, etc. And all of a sudden, everything revolves around this Thursday. And if you ask me normally, I used to say, oh, the Thursday was my least favourite of the meeting, you know, <laughs> but, but not this year. You know, it's A vested interest <laughs> changes our minds. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Well, it's exciting. That that's the thing. At the minute, it's exciting, and I think the closer it gets, obviously, they probably switch to to nerves a little bit more. But you've done sort of everything you can do, and you know, you, you just say. Well, you there's only to, uh... there's only one other thing I've told Fergal to do, is if he could arrange a ferry strike <laughs> sometime over the weekend. Yeah, that would be good. Don't worry, we'll flight him. That won't work. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, remind me, who else other than Nick is in the syndicate? There are some other members, aren't there? But, yeah, there's, there's just another, another, his brother and uh, another person from work. It's quite a close syndicate. There's mm. only two of us. And it, that must be lovely, being able to share it with family and close friends. Oh, you know, right. That must so, be so it, special. It is. And we've now got like a little fan club because of dice art more than anything else. And everybody wants to know how she's doing, et cetera. Yeah, it's, it's created a lot of interest. If you'd have turned around when we were buying that horse and this is what was going to happen, couldn't have dreamed that this could have happened. Mm -hmm. But it could happen for anyone. And really, if they could get together a group of people, you know, and you can't compete with the big names you mentioned before. 
you know, in the way of buying the really expensive horses. But that doesn't mean that there's not a little nugget out there, you know, that you could do something, you know, do something with. And I'd encourage people because it's, it's an experience second to none. You know, I think it's great. Well, we've really enjoyed the exploits of Dysart Enos, and I'm hoping she's going to be writing another major chapter this Thursday. Thank you very much for joining us, us Ben and Stephen, and the rest of your syndicate. Very best of luck. Enjoy these moments, because they're going to be really special. I look forward to seeing you next week. Thanks Thank a lot, you. guys. Best of luck. What a lovely story. I mean, that's the thing. You, you, you spend very little amount of money being part of a, a sort of microshare syndicate, Pentland Hills owned by the owners group. And that's what it sparks. It, it, can, it can spark that kind of um, multiplying Start interest. Interest, yeah. yeah, exactly. And to be fair, they got together and like, she wasn't cheap. She was, she cost a few quid after she was second, 95, she was second in a point of point, but you'd easy get her for tonight. And, you know, they've got and three, with, it. <laughs> three with Donald McCain. They've got young Buster as well with Fergal O'Brien. You know, yeah. they're starting to be right little J.P. McManuses, aren't they? Yeah, with their, with their it has to start somewhere. <laughs> it does start small, and that's how it can blossom. I, do th I think that's the key to horse racing you know, being, remaining popular, I think, for, in, the, in the general population. That I people... would agree with you, but we have four and a half minutes left in this show, and if we start that argument, we'll be here at midnight. It's not an argument. It's not an argument. Debate. I think we Sorry, both agree. Debate. I think we both agree. Right, we have some news to get through. You will know by now that Ibirico Lord, we've discussed him already, has been supplemented for the champion hurdle. I think that's a good decision. So do I. Uh, wide open contest. Thought he won more impressively even at Newbury than he did at Cheltenham. So, yeah, a good call, I would think. Maximum of eight for the champion hurdle, you think? Yeah, I would think so, yeah. But that's the the, the remnants of Constitution Hill and the impact he was having on the whole champion hurdle division. There was horses that went chasing that are probably wishing they stayed hurdling now. And how do you think uh, we should be approaching Nicky Henderson's runners as a result of Constitution Hill coming out and those pulls up that I've, I've been, been talking yeah, about? Yeah, this, this weekend would be a different weekend and I'd be more... I'll be watching the horses on Tuesday. I think we have three more days after Tuesday. You have to watch Tuesdays and you can back a few winners of Nicky's Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. I'd say you'll be all right. Yeah, yeah. I anticipate that Jericho de Repede might drift in the Sky Bet Supreme. There's only three runners uh, for a maximum of three runners for Nicky Henderson between now and the uh, Supreme Raw. Crazier than Daisy runs in the Sandown bumper on Saturday. I think all eyes will be on her. Now, of course, you also know that Marine National is out. Uh, what is Willie Mullins doing with his five Arkle? entries in that race. Fasal Viga, Gaelic Warrior, Hunter Jean, Ileti Tom we discussed, Sharjah. Between Fasal Viga, the, the, the horses that this season have been the big two, which one do you think? I can see three running uh, Marine, or not Marine, Fasal Viga or Gaelic Warrior, Hunter Jean, Ileti Tom. I can see Willie with three there, Sharjah possibly going two and a half. Okay. Right. Um, by the way, you move markets, Key de Bourbon, you put him up for the Martin Pipe and... There's some ridiculous place now, isn't he? Do you think it's ridiculous? Oh, yeah, the handicap hurdle. Yeah. Okay. Seven to two. And Sam Majesty, do you like him? I think he's a chance. I think he's more probably likely to go Coral Cup. He has a squeak, but I don't think his Limerick form is literal. Okay. Right, we asked you to put forward your nomination for the best ride. This is the winner, Paul Sercombe. Congratulations. He votes for JT McNamara on Rith Dub in the 2002 National Hunt Chase. The horse was a complete monkey who stopped every time he passed another horse. So for any jockey, let alone an amateur, to coax that horse to get his head in front on the line had to be a great ride. And it was. Please show it. Your wish, Paul? is our command. He was an amateur only in title, so don't confuse yourself there, Paul. There was nothing amateurish about John Thomas. Davy Russell outside him on Tim Bear, isn't it? Um, as they head to the last, but look, with Dove, exactly, doesn't do a whole pile when he gets to the front, and JT just keeps sitting on him, squeezes him all the way down, slapping the shoulder, pull him back on the bridle, make Rit Dove think he's going better than he was, jumps to last, and even here, he, he just keeps squeezing him into the bridle. Um, don't press go, don't make him think he's not capable of winning. Okay, yeah, just tricky into winning. A ride of extraordinary finesse, this. Beautiful. Yeah. Chalk it down. Yeah, beautiful stuff. 
Right, well, thank you very much for joining us for this extended edition of Road to Cheltenham. We will be back. Make sure you join us on Monday. We have our live preview show live from the track. We'll be joined by Nick Luck. There'll be loads of interviews. Ruby and I will be assessing all the key races for the Cheltenham Festival. We'll also be doing a wrap every day, won't we, at the Cheltenham Festival after yeah. each of the four. And uh, there will also be a column between now and next week and also a column per Not day for, me, don't want. for the Road to Cheltenham for, in full of effect. Thank you very much for your Thank company you. this evening. It's been a packed show. I hope you've enjoyed hearing from all of our guests. Thank you for watching. We'll see you on Monday for Red Shutnam Live. Paddy Power, sponsors of The Road to Cheltenham. Watch live racing now on RacingTV.com.